Now tonight we're on chapter 8, which is you and your associates. Nope, it's not 7. I said read 7, but I'm not going to teach you. We'll, we'll cover that uh, in the next couple of months when we have communion and foot washing. We'll go over it again. So Tonight it's about you and your associates. And as it says here, birds of a feather flock together. Amen. One of the things that I think that we forget is the fact that who you hang out with says a lot about you. And if we are not careful, we can get a damaged name and reputation by doing what we say is trying to be a light to a dark world. Now what do I mean by that? There are times when people are trying to witness to gangbangers or drug addicts or dope heads or whatever you want to call them and they dress like them and talk like them saying I have to reach them. Nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus didn't come here talking like a fisherman so he could reach Peter, he didn't dress like no fisherman, didn't act like one to win him over. All he did was said, follow me. That was it. When you are hungry for something, you don't have to fix it up. Let, let me ask you this. When was the last time that you went to McDonald's and on their menu they show their food on a plate with all the fixings all around it and garnishes and all that and little sauce dabbed on the side. They don't do all of that. If you're hungry, you'll stop, hit the drive through get you something to eat, and go on about your business. And, and be in there the whole time praying that nobody sees your car. Because you don't want folks knowing that you eat at McDonald's. I'm not bad at McDonald's. I ain't got no problem with them at all. But you know, that's the, way, that's the way our lives are. And if we are not careful, we can be deceived into thinking the only way to win people to the Lord is to act like them without realizing that when I do that, once they get here, then I got to tell them, oh, you can't act like that no more? But that's what I was acting like when I was winning them. So it's okay for you to act like that, but now that I got the Holy Ghost, I can't? No, that's, that's confusing. And, and we know that the Bible tells us that the Lord is not the author of confusion. So when you get saved, it's important to know who we are hanging out with. In the book of Amos, chapter 3 and verse 3, he says this. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Good question. This is talking about our social life. I've heard people use this scripture concerning marriage. Um, this is not really a scripture banning marital a marriage relationship between a saint and a sinner, a, a believer and an unbeliever. This is not what the scripture is talking about. This is dealing with our social life. Can we walk together? Can we hang out with each other? Can we spend time together except we be agreed? So, I, I want us to understand he's not saying that you can't be with sinners. He said, can you be together except you be agreed? But what does he mean by agreement? Well, well, what if you like flying a model airplane and there's somebody else that flies a model airplane but they don't have the Holy Ghost but you all go to the flight park together you fly your airplanes together and you go on about your business is that a sin? Because that, that's not what he's talking about with this it is possible for you to be in agreement with people that don't have the Holy Ghost 
but they are respectful of you and your belief. Some of us have family members that don't have the Holy Ghost. Do you know it's possible for you to get married to someone and then later on one of you get the Holy Ghost? Does that mean that you should not be together anymore? Because No, because as long as you're still agreed, ain't nothing wrong with that. The problem comes when your lifestyle runs in opposition to mine, and, but we still find common ground to hang out with each other. What does it look like? Now, how, how can I say this without being offensive? Sisters, you know there's some prostitutes, but y'all like to talk about knitting. And so you go down to the corner and you hanging out with them, sharing knitting tips with each other while they waiting for the next car to pull up. What do you think people going to think about you? No, exactly. I mean, here's the thing. You are hanging out with people who have a lifestyle that is so different than what you do that it makes you look bad now. And we don't want anyone speaking evil about our lifestyle. We don't want anyone speaking evil about us. You see me riding around with the dope dealer. What do you think people going to think about me? They're going to think I'm a dope dealer too. They're not going to think, oh wow, the drug dealer must be trying to get their life together because they're hanging out with a saint. They're not going to say that. They're going to say, wait a minute, I thought they were saved. What are they doing hanging out with the drug dealer? So we have to measure this by what is it going to make me look like? Also, what agreement do I have with them? Amen? Because what if my agreement with them is about something completely different? What, oh, name a hobby. Skateboarding. Well, that's not a hobby. He said it's a death wish. It's a good way to break bones, <laughs> that's for sure. Skateboarding down here, yes, sir. Building. Model building. Now, if, if you're with someone that's a model builder, and you're a model builder, and that's what you all are talking about, there's nothing wrong with that. So he's not saying that you can't talk with or be around sinners, but the question is, can you be around each other except you be in agreement with each other? And if your lifestyle is so out of whack that you're making me look bad, we got nothing to do with each other. I have family members I can't hang out with. Are you so... Ooh, they may be watching. I mean, let me be careful. Your lifestyle might be so bad that I can't be seen hanging out with you. I don't want people thinking I'm like you are. In 2 Corinthians... In chapter 6 and verse 14, he says this, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Now, I know I've heard people use this scripture a lot, even pastors, concerning marriage. Uh, but, and sisters, y'all help me out. Do you feel like your husband is yoked? to you I, nowhere in the bible does this say that marriage is being yoked with somebody it says you won with somebody Amen. doesn't it yeah. God doesn't use terminology like that to describe an institution that he came up with that's supposed to be a special relationship between you and another person you and your wife or you and your husband and to say yoke implies that it's a burden well, <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> doesn't the Bible say the anointing breaks the yoke? So if you are yoked and you're married, then the anointing is going to give you your divorce, isn't it? That's not scriptural. So we're not talking about marriage with that. Amen. <laughs> 
We can't be yoked or in business. Yoking means that you are now bound together by something. And we don't, or at least we should be extremely careful who we are going into business with. Sinners, I guess let me just slow down and explain this. Um, there's a program my wife likes to watch called The Good Doctor. First one or two episodes had me so irked, I didn't want to see it no more. And let me tell you why. Because they're trying to persuade this young man who just says things like it is that he needs to learn how to be a good liar. And they keep telling him, you need to lie. You don't tell people stuff like that. Tell them this. He said, but that's a lie. And they said, yes, just be, you got to learn how to do it right. I have a problem with that. Now, I, I don't, I'm not saying she shouldn't look at it. It just irks me that we make lying. And the Bible says all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire, doesn't it? But we got TV shows telling people it's normal to lie. It's appropriate under certain circumstances. You should learn how to lie. So now the reason why I'm saying all of this is because in the business world today, a lot of stuff is based on lying. It's not, it's not knowing the, next, the, the, the proper tax code. It's lying on your taxes. It's not about knowing the loopholes with state law. It's about tricking the law. Well, if I get caught, what's going to be the damages? Let me tell you, um, uh, General Motors, when I, when I was a summer student and I was working there, as an intern, one of the things that they did was they calculated. They would know that there was something wrong with a vehicle. And they said, well, now, if this part fails, will it cause a car accident? Yes. All right. If it causes a car accident and someone is killed and they sue us, how much will we lose? Well, statistically, it would be this many vehicles, this many potential fatal accidents, and we could lose a hundred million dollars in lawsuits, in a class action lawsuit. We could lose up like a hundred million dollars. Well, how much is it going to cost to bring them all back in and fix them? Well, it's going to cost two billion dollars. They say, oh, just let them stay out there. They knew some of this stuff was dangerous, but let us stay out there because it's cheaper to pay the lawsuit than it is to fix the problem. Now, we have to be careful in being in business with people that do things like that. Because if I'm your business partner and it makes more sense to save money and not care about someone's life or livelihood or health, we have to be careful. Let me tell you something else businesses have to do. They have to fire people. And sometimes one of the owners might get mad at somebody that works there, somebody that you like, and you know they're going to fire them, being vindictive and for the wrong reasons, and you're trying to talk them out of it, and they say, too bad, they're getting fired anyway. Now, you're stuck in this position of you're being a part of something or someone that's doing something bad, and you're bound to that. So... He said, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Why? Because what fellowship do you have with them? Right. We should be on the same page with our decisions. We're going to do what's right, no matter how much it hurts. We want to do what's right. So sometimes you make a business decision when you save. You might have to make a business decision that hurts you, that costs you but you do it anyway. Amen. Amen. Even as saints, we run into these issues where they, there's times when the company will ask you to do something wrong and you have to tell them, I'm not doing that. You might lose your job, but I'm not going to do wrong. 
So what happens when you become a business partner with someone like that? You're right, it could be a disaster. So we don't do that. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And that's right living. What communion hath light with darkness? None. So our business dealings, uh, when we go into business, we need to make sure that we're not yoking ourselves with unbelievers. Sometimes the temptation is, well, they've got money and I need the investment. That's not a good enough reason for God. It's a violation of his word. If God has it in his plans to bless you in your business, he can do it without a sinner's money. There are churches who are trapped with this very thing right now. They are so attached to a certain lifestyle that they're willing to allow sinners to do things in the church so they can keep money coming in. That's the problem when you are yoking yourself with unbelievers. Amen. I'm like this. Christ Temple Church is not going to be involved with that. Make it or break it. I'm not going down as the one that allowed sin to be in the church just so we could have money. I'm not doing it. Now, I could, I could lose my job. The saints could hold a secret meeting and vote me out. It'd be against the constitution of the church, but let's just say. <laughs> vote me out. And it wouldn't be the first time a pastor has been put out of a church for what he's teaching or preaching. But the bottom line is, I'm not changing just because we want money. I'm not changing just because it's my family. I'm not changing just because it's somebody I love. I'm not going to do it. It's going to hurt my feelings. I don't take no pleasure in saying, nope, you ain't living right. I don't take no pleasure in that. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna face God and say I shouldn't have done that. Amen. On the next page, water seeks its own level. I want us to understand that just because you shouldn't hang out with sinners doesn't mean that you should hang out with anybody just because they say they saved. Amen. The same thing still applies. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now I'll tell you something that's beautiful about a small area like where we are. Everybody knows when somebody ain't doing right. We know. Let me tell you the problem with that in the city, though. Just because you go to a church don't mean that people know you. There's big churches there. And troublemakers, they don't just leave and go to another church because they think somebody's going to know that they're a troublemaker. They just find other troublemakers in the church and they hang out with each other. The gossipers in the church find other gossipers in the church and they hang out with each other. And they sit around and badmouth all the other members and the, and the ministry and the pastor and the music and, and the ushers and the van drivers. and Oh, they just, they, they just want to gossip. But in a church that's in a small area like this, yeah, we know who the troublemakers are. We know who the gossipers are. We know who all the shady folks are. We know... So it's not an easy thing to uncover. I mean, it's not a difficult thing to uncover. It's not a difficult thing for somebody to say, I'm not going to hang around with them because they're they, they not doing right. It's just very difficult in the city because it's not until you get wound up and wrapped up in it that you realize, oh, I shouldn't be hanging out with them. And we go to church together. Just because someone says they're saved, doesn't mean they're saved. Just because someone's a hard worker in the church doesn't mean they're saved. Just because somebody donates a child wing for the church, a Sunday school wing on the church, doesn't mean they're saved. All right, in St. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20, Jesus says this, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So what fruits is he talking about? 
somebody that is building the wing on the church? Well, that's, it seems like that's fruit, doesn't it? Somebody that's around the church doing all kinds of stuff? That seemed like that would be fruit. Ooh, they're a hard worker in the church. Yes, ma'am. She said, what does the word wherefore mean? Wherefore means, uh, does that point forward or does it point backwards? I know, yeah, it's for this cause, but which direction does it point? Do you remember? It points forward, yeah. See, that's what happens when you get old. See, when you're young, you remember stuff like, I knew, I knew you would have it, one of y'all. For this cause, we're looking forward now. Well, therefore, when you see the word therefore, it's pointing back. It's saying, look at what happened back here to, to, to go forward. It's based on what happened back, what I just got through saying. The building is on fire. Therefore, we need to leave. You see what I mean? Based on what I just said, therefore, we're going to do this. Wherefore says... We're looking forward, not because of what just happened, but because of this now. Wherefore, by their fruits. He didn't talk about their fruits previously. He's talking about wherefore now. For this cause, by their fruits, you'll know them. So what fruits is he talking about? Why are you? Wait, don't nobody know? Him? Fruit of the Spirit, that's one. Yeah, the Bible tells us the way saved people conduct themselves, doesn't it? It tells us. So just because somebody is the best church vacuumer that they've ever come across does not mean that they write with God. And Jesus demonstrates that in the very next verse. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody that's, that's calling me their Lord, not everyone that says they're my servant, doesn't mean that they're going to heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That's how we know the fruit. Those that are doing the will of God. You've got to be doing what God asks you to do or you're not going to make it to heaven. Many, uh, this, this bothers me, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? How many? Many. That, that says that there's a whole lot of folks that go to church that's not going to make it these are not folks that said I didn't know any better I didn't even know there was a God wasn't sure what church to go to he's not talking about that group of people he's talking about the ones that profess to be saved many of them Lord have we not prophesied and did not preach in your name who's he talking about Preachers, but what preachers? Those is preaching in the name of Jesus. And in thy name have cast out devils. Now, I know this is something that um, causes some consternation with folks. In Matthew, I mean in uh, uh, Mark 16, 16 and 16 or 15, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. How do we cast out devils in the name of the Lord? By just walking up to folks and throwing some holy water on them? Like they did in the exorcist? The spirit of Christ compels you. The spirit of Christ compels you. Is that, how, is that what he's talking about? No. He's talking about baptizing someone in the name of Jesus. In your name we cast out devils. Now... Let me ask the question again. Who are we talking about here? We're talking about apostolic people, aren't we? Who else cast out devils in the name of Jesus? Now, in all fairness, can the devil cast out devils? Jesus said, when they accused him of being a devil, he said, if the devil cast out devils, his house can't stand. His house is divided. 
So, we're talking about apostolic people. I preached in your name. I baptized in your name. That's how, that's how we're getting devils out of people, isn't it? When we baptize them in the name of the Lord. That spirit comes out of him and he goes around looking for some place. And when he can't find any place, he come back looking for you. And when he finds you, he says, is, is, is the house still empty? It's still clean, but is the Lord in there? Oh, the Lord's not in there. Let me go get seven more of my friends and we coming back and we're going to take over the house. That's why I don't just baptize people. Just because they say they want to be baptized. I want to know why. Are you trying to get the Holy Ghost? Some churches feel like baptism numbers is as important as offerings. And it's not. That's, that's not fair what we do to people. They need to know. Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Before you baptize anybody, you need to be teaching them. Somebody come into church visiting. Now, here, here's what I, I would do. Cause somebody was asking me about someone getting the Holy Ghost and they wanted to baptize him. I said, let them get the Holy Ghost first. I'm not trying to stir up no trouble with... It, it was a minor. They were a, a minor and they was coming. They wanted to get the Holy Ghost. They wanted me to baptize them. And I knew that the family was opposed to it. I said, let them get the Holy Ghost and then I'll baptize them. Because you can get the Holy Ghost first. It, you can do that. All right, there's nothing in the Bible that's against it. We see it happen often. Some folks going into the pool get the Holy Ghost. I said, well, let them get the Holy Ghost first, then I'll baptize them. Because once they get the Holy Ghost, can I forbid water? Can't forbid it now. I don't care if the family are mad or not. If they got the Holy Ghost, I'm putting them down in the name of the Lord. So, we are talking about the church, not Christendom, not the nominal church that profess to be Christians. We're talking about those who are. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And what's the Lord going to tell them? I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I don't even know who you are. You may have been doing stuff in the name of the Lord. You may have been professing and claiming to be saved, but you're not saved. You don't have a Holy Ghost. You, I don't even know who you are. So just because people say that they're saved doesn't mean that you should be on board with them. You should be discerning about who you hang out with. You don't hang out with folks. Amen. Go ahead. Yes. Yep. His, his question was, is, when he said, I never knew you, is that folks that professed to be um, apostolic but never had the Holy Ghost? Yep. You'd be surprised how many people have um, faked speaking in tongues. There's, there, are, there are ministers that will whisper in your ear tongues for you to say and they're like, oh, that's it right there and here's here's how they justify themselves well they don't know what they said so it was an unknown tongue to them I said yeah that's true but it wasn't because the spirit gave them utterance it's because you gave them the utterance now if you are the Holy Ghost that's different but you don't we, you don't do stuff like that some of them, peeping and muttering, come in, get called into the ministry, and they out preaching and deceiving other folks, yeah. deceiving whole congregations. Yeah, how many? It's going to be many of them. Many. Now, let's just be clear. This is not the totality of people that's going to miss it with the Lord. This is a specific group of folks that he's talking about. There are other people that's going to miss it for other reasons. I had the Holy Ghost correctly, and I was holding the truth in unrighteousness. I still wasn't going to do right. 
Some folks are like that. There's a whole lot of reasons why. Now, he won't tell them, I never knew you. He, I knew you. What happened to you? You did run well. What hindered you? What caused you to start messing up like that? So there's going to be a whole lot of folks that's going to answer for different reasons. The point is just because someone has the Holy Ghost doesn't mean that they are living right. And it's a shame that you have to be careful who you hang out with even in the church that you attend that's a shame but you better be watching out yes ma'am <laughs> she said maybe we shouldn't hang out with anybody we got to we've, we've got oh, you bring up a good point too I forgot about it how does anyone get saved if we don't ever hang out with anybody we can't be a witness to them we, we can't we cannot we can't be a witness we cannot be a light if we barricade ourselves off and never around anybody now now I think we still we still need to be discerning on who exactly we do hang out with there are people that I've worked with I'm not, I'm not interested in going out to dinner with them, but I will sit and eat lunch with them. And there's some folks I've worked with, I don't even want to eat lunch with you. I sit at another table, I'd rather go out and sit in my car. I used to do it. I'd go sit in the car, turn my church music on, and sit there and get myself together because, you know, you can be around uh, sinners that are so bad they make you feel dirty. I had to go out and recharge my battery. That's, that's the truth I'm not hanging around with you I, I don't want to and there's a lot of times when they're doing after work activities or after yeah after work activities or after school activities sometimes sometimes we go and do things with them it's like well our family is going out to dinner and we wanted to invite your family to come out to dinner sure I, I will because you know they're good people they're decent folks maybe give you an opportunity to talk to them about the Lord but if we just start shutting everybody down, you're never going to win anyone to the Lord. Yes, ma'am. I'll answer that. Her question is, is it possible there's a danger in being to yourself and does that lead into self-righteous or do we segregate ourselves off being self-righteous? And, and, and I want to look at this a couple of ways because I'll tell you something about me. I am thoroughly and utterly satisfied sitting by myself with no one around I, I could come home every day and stay home all day by myself not talk to anybody and I'm fine with that it's not that I'm trying to do it because I'm so saved that's just my personality you too well amen I can do that I have it, it, that's my that's my natural tendency. My natural tendency is to just stay home by myself. As long as my wife is in the house with me somewhere. <laughs> Sometimes she'll fuss at me. You ain't said nothing to me. I'm like, I'm just glad you're here. <laughs> I don't have to say nothing. As long as, you, as long as I know you're here somewhere, I'm okay. That's, that's me. All right. So it's not a matter of I don't want to be around people. That's not it at all. When I'm around folks, I'm OK with that. But my natural tendency is to just go off by myself and sit and do my own thing. I, that's me. Now, that's different than saying, well, I'm saved and I'm not hanging out with anybody because I don't want to be around sinners. And I'm not sure who's living right that does have the Holy Ghost. I ain't hanging out with nobody. That's different. I knew somebody that did that. And it was because of her personality. She's like, I just don't, I don't have time to be fooling around with folks acting silly. It just bothers me. It was bothering her spiritually. Make me mad. I don't want to be around that. So when the church would have functions like that, where it'd be a whole bunch of folks getting together, she wasn't coming. She's like, no, nah, I'm going to get my, keep myself together. She'd be faithful to church, 
was a minister, good preacher, but you wasn't getting her hanging out. Yes, sir. How are we going to win people if we keep living like what? He said, how can, how can we win people if we keep on ignoring people, period? We can't. I mean, we, we have to interact with people. We do. And you can't win people if, if I can say it like this. If you make them think that being saved makes you a weirdo that, and you can't do anything with anybody, nobody wants that. And what did they say about Jesus? He hung out with sinners. Didn't it say that? But let me tell you the difference. When Jesus hang out, hung out with sinners, when he left, the sinner was different. Now, can you say that about you? That when you hang out with someone that doesn't have the Holy Ghost, when you walk away, you've made them different. They haven't changed you. Yes, ma'am. Let me, let me, um, well, first, her, her comment is about the fact that she worked someplace for 10 years and that no one got saved in that time that she was there. And there were even times when they would tell her not to come to certain meetings because they knew she was going to tell the truth. And honestly, I, I have that happen to me e even today. I just had someone tell me that today. They said, well, if you're going to be here, just be quiet because I know you'll tell the truth. And if you do, it's going to stir up some trouble. I said, okay, I'll, I can sit and be quiet. Because I'll just tell it like it is, like a T.I. is. Here's the thing, though. We cannot allow ourselves to base how spiritual I am on how many people I win to the Lord. Let me tell you why. How many people did Jesus lose when he said, except you drink my blood and eat my flesh? He lost all but 12. Didn't he? How many of them were saved before that? None of them. Holy Ghost hadn't even fell yet. But he lost all of them. And of the 12 that stayed, one of them was a devil. So if we, if we try to compare ourselves, he was God in the flesh. And how many did he keep? Eleven. How are we going to outdo that? You cannot base your salvation on, well, I've been saved for 30 years and 42 people have received the Holy Ghost. You can't do that. If not a single person ever gets the Holy Ghost that you've witnessed to, your job is to witness to him. You can't save him anyway. Yes, sir. He said that he, he went to a, a youth conference and the, the pastor or one of the ministers there that was speaking said, um, if you have, if 10 people have been saved because of you, stand up or raise your hand. And nobody did. And then they just kept going down lower and lower and lower. And, he, and then he starts giving out statistics um, the average young person comes in contact with this many people. And so you should be winning people to the Lord. But that, that's contradictory to the word of God. Yes, we should be winning people to the Lord. That's, that's true. If you don't win somebody to the Lord, they ought to at least be able to say like they did with the apostles. They took note that they had been with the Lord. They should be able to say that. He said they, when Paul was Peter and uh, Peter and John or one, two of the apostles, Peter and somebody, they they were they said we perceive that they are ignorant, but they took note that they had been with the Lord. They they knew something was different about them because they had been with the Lord. So even if nobody comes and gets the Holy Ghost based on you witnessing to them, they ought to at least say, but he was different. She was different. Amen. They was living what they said. Amen. Too many folks talk church but live like devils. Let me, let me move on here. He, 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 there are more than just uh, people in church that don't live right. And we have to be careful because some are just weak in the Lord. In Romans 14, 
and one. Him that is weak in faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. What do we do with weak people? We receive them, don't we? We don't sit around saying, hmm, here they are in church again, knowing good and well they ain't doing right. We don't sit around doing stuff like that. We receive them it, because some people are just weak and they're trying. They just haven't got their feet under them yet. I can say that that's, that, that has been me. There was a time when I was weak and was confused and was not sure whether I wanted to be saved or I knew I wanted to be saved but wasn't sure if I wanted to live right. I just kept on coming, kept on coming, kept on coming. After a while, I got my wind. It's like, hey, hey, this thing is real. I want this. You can't just kick people to the curb just because they're not living as strong as you are. We have to be careful about that. We cannot help someone to stay saved if all we do is judge their life and say, hmm, I saw you at the grocery store walking down the liquor aisle. Uh, they may have been, the manager might have told them, you need to go down there, because Harding's is like that. <laughs> you got to walk down through the beer aisle to get to the ice cream. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't go around judging folks like that. Say, uh-huh, I know they had a problem with liquor before they got saved, and look at them now, I saw them in the liquor aisle, and they might have been heading down to get a quart of ice cream. You have no idea. We shouldn't be just casting people off because I don't think they are as strong as they ought to be. How will they get strong if you don't help them? He said, but not to doubtful disputations. Don't be arguing and fighting over whether somebody is right or wrong. I tell people this all the time. They get an attitude about someone, well, I, they ain't doing right. I'm like, how do you know? Leave them alone. Pray for them. The Bible said rejoice with them that rejoice. If they happy, be happy with them. Now, I'm not talking about happy with them in sin, but they come to church. I'm happy today. I'm glad to be in church. And you sitting back grumbling. Uh-huh, but what was you doing yesterday? Forget all of that. Something may be said and they catch a hold. And you know what? That's the reason why I keep telling us. Greet visitors. Show them love. Don't let this pandemic cause you to not even want to talk to folks. I mean, I mean they, they, we, ooh, they, they really bothering me with this. But amen. Here's the thing. You shouldn't let it stop you from socializing with people. I had somebody tell me here recently, I came to church, but nobody talked to me. I'm like, wow. That's a shame. Somebody came to me and said, I came and I came to your church on Sunday. And they stood around after service, but nobody came up and shook their hand. Nobody came and talked to them. Now, I'm going to say this like the apostle did. I speak that to your shame. Nobody should feel like that when they come here. Nobody should feel like they're isolated. No one wants to talk to them. I ain't talking about grabbing them and hugging them and kissing them, but you should speak to people. Greet them. Make them feel welcome. A amen, anybody? I mean, that's the way it ought to be. You know how come the world is winning, folks? Because they'll accept them. Do we? Oh, yes. You know, thieves, thieves will be understanding of liars. They do. They do their own thing. Well, you know, hey, nobody's perfect. They come up with all kinds of excuses for them. But we sit around and we want to put folks out to church. Amen. Well, how about this? Romans 15 and 1. When then that are strong ought to bear, or we then, I'm sorry, I said when. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not 
to please ourselves. You may not like it. You may not care for the fact that they're weak. You may think they ought to know better. He said, but that ain't, that, it ain't got nothing to do with you. You ought to bear the infirmities. How do we bear it? Through prayer, through encouragement. When we see somebody struggling, we ought to be there to encourage them. And that's pleasing God, not you. Because they may be doing something that you don't agree with at all. And, and, and let me just be clear about that. It's not always that they're out in sin. But maybe they've got friends and they're hanging out with somebody that influences them negatively. And you see them, you, you're like, you know what? You need to stay away from them. They're trying to lead you away from the Lord. Yeah, you right, you right. You, I, I, I'm not going to be around them no more. And then you see them out with them again somewhere and you're like, mm, now it's making you mad. The next thing I know, I'm going to have to be hearing a sob story from them because the friend that they got done did them wrong or the person that they with has done them wrong again. It ain't about you. And even if it does get on your nerves that they keep getting tricked, let it be on your nerves. Keep encouraging them. Eventually they'll catch on or they'll just go away. But it shouldn't be because we turned our back on them. Again, let me say it again. Because, you know, sometimes I, I, I say things when I'm teaching and folks come back and tell me what I said. And I'm like, I didn't say that. I'm not talking about people that are in sin. I'm talking about brothers and sisters that are weak in the Lord. They're struggling. We should be there to bear their infirmities. We should be there to help strengthen them and not criticizing them. If I could say it this way, and this isn't even right, better to not say anything at all. If you can't encourage them, if you can't strengthen them and lift them up, it's because you're weak. Better to not say nothing at all and go about your business and get them out your mind than to sit around criticizing them and talking about them. You know, what this, you know what that demonstrates? That you don't have what you should have. Because we then that are strong should be bearing the iniquity or the infirmities of those that are weak. We should be doing that. So don't come in talking about how saved you are and how strong you are in the Lord and you're kicking everybody to the curb that ain't up to your level. You know what that means? That you don't have a real level. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. For when, for what, or for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Not everybody is at the same level. Not everybody has an understanding of God's word like you do. Jesus put it this way. There's some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Not everybody is going to be 100. Some people only have the ability to be a 60. But he didn't say for the hundreds, don't socialize, don't hang out with, don't be nice to the 30s. He didn't say that. If you're strong, help those that are 30s. Help them get to 30. And quit being mad at them because they ain't got to 35. Yes, sir. Yes, it did. Um, the, the Church of Corinth, it did uh, backslide. All because of one one man, his sin, messed up the whole church. Um, and, and, but now, let me just take this a step further. Um, in verse 13, For everyone that, is, everyone that useth milk is, un, is unskillful in the word of righteousness. So when he talks about someone being a baby in the Lord, at what time you ought to be teachers, but I need to give you milk again, 
What is he talking about? Those who don't know the word of God and how to use it properly. Some folks just don't know how to. And you'll be surprised how many people will come up and talk about the scriptures and misquote scriptures. And they think they on fire. They think they really jamming, but they just as off as they want to be. But it's not because they it's not because they don't want to know. Some of them just have not been taught. Some people don't have good teaching. And so they're unskillful in the word. They have to they have to keep texting and calling and asking. I don't I get texts every single day of the week. I get phone calls every single day of the week and sometimes it starts when I'm at the breakfast table. And I'm talking hang up. Sometimes I have to say, oh, another call's coming in because I see that we're drifting all off into something that ain't about anything. But they, they're talking and it, whatever, and it's like, okay, oh, here's another call coming in. I have to hang up with them and take another one. There's sometimes I'm on my phone for an hour and a half, two hours, before I even get dressed in the morning. But you know why? It's because somebody needs information on how to use the word on something that's going on in their life. I don't get aggravated and mad. I wish they'd leave me alone. I don't do that. I'm trying to help folks. I might get on my wife's nerves. <laughs> but she ain't a pastor. Not everybody is as skillful as someone else in the word. Some just don't get it. And it's not because they haven't been taught. Not everybody is at the same level intellectually. Just aren't. I don't care how much you explain physics, calculus. Okay, how much you explain that to me? At about minute one, my eyes are going to glaze over and I'm going to start daydreaming about something else. It's the way it is. It ain't going to work with me because I don't get it. For other folks, it's easy. No problem whatsoever. That's, that's not me. But there's other things that I get real easy that they don't get. So, we all got to work in our own wheelhouse. You know, we got to do, we got to know what we're good at and work in that. Amen. Uh, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, the key to this is by reason of use. How do you get to use the word if you don't never be around anybody? Nobody? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll move it along then. After a while, you keep studying the word of God. You keep coming to Bible class and learning. And after a while, you start to discern certain things because it doesn't line up with the word. Somebody come in talking about Jesus, 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 and oh, the change has come over me. Those things I used to do, I don't do no more. Those things I used to say, I don't say no more. And then you go out and you see them do something shady, and it's like, hmm. Sometimes it don't even take that. Sometimes you can just be around someone and hear what they're saying. And it's like, ah, uh, something ain't right. right. How do you know? You're learning to discern because of the word of God. Right. It's being exercised in you. Yeah. Finally, Ephesians 6. Finally, my brethren... 6 and 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not yours. 
Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why do we do this? Because the enemy is fighting us all the time. How, how do you fight an enemy so focused on you? Let me ask you this. When you're sleeping, are you studying the word of God? Are you praying? Are you thinking about the Lord while you're sleeping? No. How about when you're eating? Are you studying whenever you, whenever you eat? I guess I ain't going to. I, I knew that was, a, that was a foolish thing for me to ask. Brother said occasionally. I ain't talking about occasionally. I'm talking about all the time. I knew as soon as it went out of my mouth, I was like, this is a mistake. But I was already committed. I had to get it all out. We have other activities that we do. We're at work. We're not thinking about God all the time when we're at work. We're married. We're not thinking about God all the time when we're being romantic. <laughs> I don't care how saved you are. There, but you know what? The devil doesn't have distractions. He's thinking about you. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, how I can trip you up. So, if you don't put on the whole armor of God, he will get you. You cannot withstand the wiles of the devil. You can't do it. So then he clears up this part. Because you think you know what you're doing, but you don't. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood just because somebody does something bad to you doesn't mean that you need to get even with them because they're just a tool that's all there's no point in being mad at guns the gun is just a tool be mad at the gun wielder you understand what I'm saying you are using a hammer and, and somebody come up and they kill someone with a hammer. You don't get mad at the hammer, do you? You don't get mad at the stick that they use to beat somebody to death with. Okay, now I'm saying that because of this. The devil uses sinners who can't help but do sin anyway. They don't have a choice. We do, but they don't. The devil uses them to do bad things. Why are you mad at the tool and not the one wielding the tool? If we want to be mad at somebody, be mad at the devil. And that's why he's saying, we're, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. That's who you see, but that's not who you're fighting. No, we wrestle. We're wrestling against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of darkness. Now just consider this. There are evil things that are taking place. We live in a kind of a sterilized environment. There are countries where people are 100% being taken advantage of, enslaved, being used as sex slaves, male and female, children. So there's a lot of things that we don't see, but there is some serious darkness in this world. That's what we're fighting against. The darkness of this world. Not the church of this world. We're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. Not fake spiritual, for real spiritual wickedness in high places. That's not part of the world. That's part of the church. So we got a fight going on in the world and in the church. Sometimes the fight is in your own house. Didn't the scripture say where you get them wounds? <laughs> From the household of friends? Your own friends sometimes will turn on you and treat you bad. Yeah, they will. Sometimes... Why are you look at me like that? I'm 
looking at everybody. Brother said, <laughs> you ain't turned on me, have you? I ain't turned on you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You, you right. She said, you gotta, we got to fight within ourselves. We do. We got to fight this flesh. We got to fight sometimes our spouse. Hallelujah. <laughs> sometimes we got to fight our children. Sometimes we got to fight our boss. But we should understand that none of it has to do with flesh and blood. All of it has to do with the spirit behind it. Some people give themselves over. The Bible says they are of a baser sort. They give themselves easily and readily over to the influence of the devil. Some folks fight that. Now they can't get the victory. They do good, but they're not 100%. And some folks don't even try to fight it. Whatever comes to their mind, they just do it. Whatever feels good, I'm doing it. And I don't care who I hurt. That thought didn't come from them. That idea come from the devil. He does that. Because what is the devil's whole thing? Kill, steal, destroy. Anytime you see that taking place, that's not a person doing that. That's a spirit behind that. Folks come in, I'm going to tear up everything. I'm cutting tires. You see them vandalizing buildings and putting graffiti all over stuff. That's not them. That's the devil. You're destroying somebody's private property. You're defacing someone's property. That ain't, that's not them. You need to be praying against the spirit behind it. Yes. She said that I, I said it's the devil, but don't they know they're doing it? Yes, they know they're doing it. But Paul said, when I would do good, evil is present. So you can think, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to do it this time and then I ain't going to do it no more. But then you get up and there is evil knocking at the door. After a while, you just give in. Let me, let me say it like this. Have you ever fasted? Did you ever fast and give up during a fast? But did you know that you were giving up? You gave up because you, you knew you shouldn't, but your, but your hunger drove you. If you don't go on and eat, something bad's going to happen to you. She said the food was looking good to her. But, that's, but you know what? You were being influ Listen, there are many things that we know that we should do. We know it. But we are being influenced all the time. And sometimes we lose the victory. And I'm not talking about just sin. There's times when we just lose the victory. There have been times I've sitting and I'm thinking, I need to study. I'm going to watch one more episode. And then I'm going to study. And it's like, oh, a cliffhanger. All right. One more. And then I'm going to study. And it's like, ah, we had... All right, one more, and then I'm going to start studying. It's like, well, it's 11 o'clock now. I'll study tomorrow, but I'm going to watch one more episode. Okay, well, you know what? I know better, but I'm being influenced by my flesh. There are some people who are being influenced by the devil. They know they shouldn't do it, but they're being influenced. And, and it's, a, it's a compulsion in them. You got... People that don't have the Holy Ghost got devils in them. And some of them got more than one devil. Well, how long do you keep on fighting them devils before you just give up? You wake up in the morning, the devil is influencing you. You go through your day, the devil's influencing you. You go to bed, the devil's influencing you. And after a while, it's like, ah, oh, they just give up and go on and give in. It's not that they don't know. What are we fighting against? The spirit behind them that's doing it. That's why... That's why he said, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. You fighting people, you fighting the wrong thing. You know, there are people that have killed folks 
And then when you see them in court, they just as pitiful. I, I heard someone that worked in prison one time, they said, some of them get in there and they say, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know why I did it. Well, now that spirit, now that you locked up in jail, that spirit done moved on to somebody else. Yeah. Well, I can't. Yes, sir. He's, his question is where I said, sometimes you know to do better. And he used the scripture um, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it's a sin. It, does that apply? It doesn't. Where is that scripture? Do you know offhand? It's in James, but I could be wrong. Come on, one of these preachers. Oh, Y'all anxious to get up and preach, but you don't know where a script. I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> James 4. Uh, 4 and 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And um, if you go... You go back up to verse 11. Speak not evil one of another. Because remember, he's saying, therefore, right? What does that mean? Which direction do we point in therefore? We go back on therefore. Wherefore, forward. Therefore, back. Therefore. Therefore what? Well, because... Uh, and and you, can, you can go all the way back to the beginning and get all of it, but... Here, 10 and 11, humble yourself, therefore, in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy who art thou that judgest another? So, then he gets down to, and he goes through some other stuff, and he gets down to, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good. What is the good? Not judging people. Leaving folks alone. Quit being evil about other people. And he goes down through a whole other list of, of some things. When you know not to do those things, and you do it anyway, that's a sin for you. Some folks do things and they don't even know it's wrong. That's not going to be a sin that's accounted to them. But when you know to do and you don't, then it is sin. So, no, there are, it's a sin when you uh, know how to treat somebody to do the right thing. And then he gives this list. But to say, I know I shouldn't, uh, I should fast today, but I'm not going to do it. That's, that, that's not saying that that's a sin. Um, but don't get too trapped up in it now because you keep on and after a while you start losing the victory and then pretty soon you just walk away. Amen. Yes, sir. His question is, he's a, he's a water operator and let's say he becomes, he gets offered the position of, of a superintendent over the water department in Vandalia. Lord, help you. I'm going to leave Vandalia alone, y'all, <laughs> tonight. So <laughs> he said, does that mean that he should not um, do that because he's being yoked with unbelievers? No, you don't own the municipality. It's talking about when you start a business. Let's say you want to start your own insurance company, but you don't have the money to do it but you got a buddy that does. He's not saved, but he's good for the money. He's trouble, but he's good for the money. So you say, I'm going to go ahead and go into business with him. So you get into business with him, and then he says, well, you know what? I'm going to take some of the profits, and I'm going to go play them on. I'm going to go play the horses. I'm going to go to the race and, and play some numbers at the racetrack. That's your money, too and using it for something like that. But how do you stop him? He's the one that invested in the company. What you gonna do? 
Now you've got yourself tied down with somebody that's doing something like that, and it looks bad. What if he wants to break the law, and you're tied to it? There are things that can happen, and they're not coming after just the one that did it. They're coming after the owners of the company. But because you're tied to them, what are you going to do? You're going to say, oh, no, if you do that, I'm walking away. Well, the best thing to have done was not start it in the first place. Then you don't have to worry about that. And it's not saying that every person that doesn't have the Holy Ghost is in sin. I mean, that's going to, every person that doesn't have the Holy Ghost is going to be a bad business partner. That's not what it's saying. But what fellowship do you have with them? Eventually, something will come up. And since you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, the best thing to do is just don't get involved with it to start with. Then you don't have to deal with it because you don't know if they're going to. They may be great right now, but as soon as you start making money, they lose their mind. There's something about making money or getting power that makes people change. And you don't go into business to stay poor. So you don't know what they're going to do once things start to become successful. Or the opposite. You don't know what they might do to make sure that the business don't fail. They go out to some loan shark or something to get money to make sure that the business succeeds. Well, don't you worry about it. I got this. Yeah, but it's your business too. You're going to be in trouble right along with them. You get an unregulated loan from a loan shark. That's illegal. And it, because you are part owner of the business, it gets you in trouble. I'm not saying that. I'm just giving some examples. We don't know all of the things. But the, if the word of God said don't do it, it's because God knows. There's too many times it's going to go wrong for you to be trying to figure that out. Just leave it all alone. Did that answer your question? That's not, that's not being, um, that's not going into business with somebody because you take a loan out from them. You got a car. If you get a loan from the bank with the car, they're the lien holder, but they're not your business partner. If you start a business and you get a loan for that business, that doesn't make them your partner. They're just an investor in your business. You own the business. But when you have a business partner, you are yoked with them. When you are yoked with somebody, where they go, you go too. They go to jail, you lie, will be going right along with them. You don't know. Leave it alone. And please, saints, don't quit your job saying, well, I was yoked with sinners. Don't do that. <laughs> You'll be yoked with debt, yoked with hunger, yoked with divorce. Uh, you, you shouldn't be yoked with a divorce, but you're liable to be. Folks, they they violating all kind of stuff today. Leave it alone. Yes, sir. First, it's not an attitude. Her question is like the sister that said that she wasn't going to be, she wouldn't fellowship with thing with when they, they had large gatherings because she didn't want to get aggravated and and mess up. What would be the advice that I would give to someone have that kind of attitude and I'm not trying to rebuke you that's not an attitude that sister knew herself she knew that she would get out of order with God if she got around that kind of foolishness so she didn't want to be involved with it these were not church functions these were extracurricular activities it's different when I'm not coming to church because there's too many people she wasn't doing that she came to all the church functions all the church uh, services, she was at all of them. But when it came down to extra stuff, she wasn't doing it. The church is going out bowling. I'm not going because they're going to be acting silly, and I don't want to be a part of that. It's going to get on my nerves, and I don't, want, I don't want that down in me because I'm liable to say something mean, and then I'm in trouble with God. So you have to know you. You have to know what you can take. And so that, that wasn't wrong for her to say, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be a part of that because I don't want to be wrong with God. That's not wrong. But her her rationale was to be right with God. When you do it because I'm so saved, I don't bowl. I'm so saved, I don't go to softball games. Now you're wrong because you got a wrong attitude, a wrong spirit. You have a wrong reason for it. Hers was I just want to be right with God, and they gonna make me be wrong with God. I know me. She had a problem with her temper. 
I don't want to lose my temper over uh, folks come up doing little practical jokes and cracking jokes and all she said, I don't want to be a part of that because they're going to say something that's going to make me mad and then I got a problem. So she stayed away from it. Some of us would do wise, do well to follow that. You know you got a problem with something, stay away from it. See, we, we, we want to act like, I, oh, I got this. I'm saved, I got it. Oh, they, the, the devil ain't going to get me. Okay, you keep on doing it. Anything else? Stand on your feet.